but it is not based on that. That is another way to learn how to test. They have a recommended order sequencing of things. So that's a great resource as well. And what I'm presenting here are my opinions. Some people, maybe you, will disagree with me. I encourage that, welcome that. At the end of the presentation, um, we should have some time for discussion. Happy to talk more about some of these things. And I'm not, you know, I, I don't know everything, right? Um, okay. Also, what I'm talking about is, for the framework of what I'm talking about today, we're talking about a Drupal website, we're a Drupal protocol, so most of this is going to be about a Drupal website CMS. Um, testing or auditing at the page or process level, so we're not talking about monitoring or a full site scan here, there are different tools to do that. Um, and I'll touch on some of them, but this, this isn't about that. And I, I've simplified a lot of these things. So WCAG has a bunch of exceptions. So they say, you must do this unless this or this or this, or you must do one of these five things. Um, so ideally, you don't have to rely on the exception. You can look more into that if, if there needs to be. This isn't meant to be um, a formal, like, pass-fail your website not about. This is more about helping you have an idea of kind of how to group and test things. Okay. So what automated checkers can test? They're great at testing parts of success criteria, but not necessarily the whole thing. They're great at flagging potential issues for manual review. Uh, they're great at assisting with manual reviews, and this is what I really want to talk about today. So, um, so while some things might be difficult to review manually, once you have a little bit of help, even if the automated checker can't say if it's pass or fail, you can get that highlight to help you um, look at something and quickly be able to tell. Um, it's really, automated checkers are really great at a particular success criterion, 4.1.1 parsing, um, but that's not obsolete. They think it's obsolete because it was something that was easy for machines to understand, so, um, so developers of browsers and things work those things in so that it is less important. Um, and automated checkers are usually based around WCAG, 508 and ADA, both have some things that aren't included in WCAG. I'm not going to get into those too much, except for, for one item, but um, it's important to know that there are a couple things beyond WCAG that if you're under 508 or ADA, you might need to uh, be aware of. Okay, humans. Humans are needed for judging if something's equivalent. So, for example, your automated checker can say, this image has an alt property. Um, they're good at telling you if you're missing that alt property. It can even tell you it has alt text. It's not a null alt property. Um, but it can't tell you, is that alt text any good? Is it equivalent to what I'm seeing? Um, it could be the file name of the image, one, two, three, four, five, underscore, dot, jpg, right? That could be your alt text. Oh, it has alt text, great, right? good job. <laughs> That's what the automated checker might say. So I, I think there are, you know, people are talking about AI, machine learning, and things like that. Oh, it can do an automated description of an image now. Um, but jumping down, to the third item here, determining intent, um, that's still a challenge, right? That's a challenge for humans too. You might have an image on a page. Why is it on that page? Why is it part of that content? What purpose is it serving here? And you might have the same image on different pages, and they might serve different purposes. And so the alt text should be um, related to what it is doing. Um, so it's an equivalent to what it's doing on that page. Um, and then 
judging if something is accurate, such as captions. Automated captions are great. They only get so far. I think we know this. I know myself. I've seen some recordings that I made. It said I said things I did not say, and I did not want people to think I said. Um, so it, important to have that review. And this is similar to like translate, right? Google Translate might get you so far, but it is good to have a fluent speaker review translations um, before you put them out there. Okay, Drupal. So there's a great page um, at Drupal.org about accessibility, and it goes into more detail and has more examples. Drupal or Drupal has accessibility features. Most of them are turned on by default, and that's great. There are a couple that you would need to enable or add, so that includes accessible inline form errors. Um, if you have forms, you would want to enable that. And in the CK editor controls, you can add the language of parts button. Um, so that's if, for example, your website might be mostly English, um, so your pages are tagged as English, but you want to have certain words here and there, or certain sections on a page in a different language, and that's where you would need that um, CK editor control. Um, there are also contributed modules for extending accessibility in Drupal. Um, a couple flagging here, editorially accessibility checker. Um, we have used this with um, some of our federal government clients, and there was a great presentation at Drupal.com last year, 2023, um, the, and it's up on YouTube, um, so you can watch that. The name of it is Content Creators Want Automated, Automatic Accessibility Checks. Um, and there's also a site improved um, module that, that connects if you have one of those tape site and group monitoring accounts, it'll help bring some of those flags into Drupal where the content editor is. I did want to share though, um, my colleague did some interviews with client power users who use this module on a Drupal site for a government organization. They said they found it was a helpful tool for flagging issues, but to explore those issues beyond what was just the, the flag, this is an issue, they had to go into the site improved interface itself. So that was a little bit of a barrier, a challenge there. Um, and since their scans only happened every two weeks, they couldn't see in real time what changes they were making. I think that's where um, you, you can watch the, the presentation about editorially, but I think um, in that presentation it talks about why he was developing it the way he was, and I think it was in part due to some of those challenges. Okay. So, how might you group and test success criteria? So, this is from my experience, my preferences. Um, certainly some some wiggle room, and um, I'd love to hear also about some of your preferences or if you've used these tools or if there are better tools. Um, but let's get into it. So, a uh, simple 12 step process, um, and I'll, I'll go through each one a little bit. But this is, this is an order. Um, all of the checks aren't needed on all of the pages. Um, you, you might not have tables on every page, so you don't need to test tables on every page, right? Um, you might not have video or audio, so it will be dependent on the content of the pages that you're testing. And this is assuming that we're looking at a page or a process, and, and not so much multiple pages or a whole thing. So first, find an automated checker. Like I said, they're great for flagging things. They're great for telling you what to look more into. Um, and you can use that as a moment to decide how deeply do you want to get into the manual testing? 
do you want to do a full audit, a full report? Is that what you're doing? Is that what's needed right now? Or do you want to do some testing, not go into deep, deep detail until some of those more major things that you're finding more major things are fixed? So for example, um, it, it's a manual test, but focus indicators. It can be really hard to test anything else if you're missing focus indicators, because if you're testing with a keyboard, it's hard to tell where your focus is, so it's hard to tell if something's working or not. Um, so um, that, that's where you might decide, depending on your purposes, depending on your um, method, if you want to fix things before doing a full test. Um, so tools, um, these are a couple of the tools that I've used. They're pretty similar to each other, they get similar results. These are all free. Um, so Accessibility Insights for Web, which is produced by Microsoft, but it is free and there's only the free version. Sightproof Accessibility Checker is a browser plugin. Um, and that is free. It's not the same thing as that purchase site improved suite of tools. Um, so it, it's the, you click your browser bar, you get a list of automatic checker issues. Accept tools is similar. Um, so that's, you add it to your browser, you access it through the browser, you run it on the page. They also have, you can pay for, um, additional services, um, but these are all free by themselves. Content review. So, I like to use Wave for this. So, WebEx Wave browser extension. Um, it will do some things that the other tools that I mentioned about automated checkers will do, um, but I don't necessarily use it for those. I use it for this. Um, because for me, it flags headings really nicely. It'll give, and I'll, I'll show a screenshot. It'll show like in a circle, H1, H2, H3 next to each heading. So that makes it easy for me to skip from the page visually um, to see are things marked as headings that should be, are things that should be headings not marked as headings, um, are they in the right order? Are but each three conceptually within it, each two things like that. So that's what I'll do with Wave. I'm going back to the previous slide. Um, so headings is big. Alt text is another one. Um, language for the page and parts of the page. So in the screenshot at the very top, um, it kind of pushes down the website and shows an icon for a little globe. Um, and tells you that this this page is marked and for language. It'll also, what I like about Wave is that if you have multiple sections, so say you have um, language access links that are in the language that they're for, standard expression, some of the sites I work on have had a set of 12 languages in the footer with links. It will show you with that little icon where each of those is marked as a different language. Um, so that's just really convenient. Um, it'll also show you what content is tagged as a list. That's another thing where sometimes visually websites have lists that should be lists but aren't tagged as lists. And we want to make sure that that's, um, that's showing that you know 1.3.1 information and relationships we want that accessible to assistive technology. Um, there are some alternatives, so if you don't like Wave, it's overwhelming, it's too much, um, or it just doesn't work well for you, W3C has draft easy checks um, page right now. So they have an existing page that's easy checks, and they have a draft one that links to pages that have some bookmark lists. So these are like, it's like a link almost you add to your bookmark bar in your browser, and you go to a page, you click on it, it runs a little check 
um, it shows you something. So there are a couple of those that are really handy. So it'll show you heading structure, it'll have a list of headings on the page and what their text is. It'll flag image alt text for each of the images on the page. And it'll show language of the page. It won't do language of parts, but it'll do language of the page. So then, step three. Um, so we've done automated checks. We've done some checks using Wave to, to review some of the content. And then, keyboard entry reader. So we have a lot of things we're checking here. And I do recommend using a keyboard and screen reader to do most testing. Um, unless there's something we'll get to mouse and pointer specific items. But otherwise, like, it's just convenient. It's good to get comfortable with keyboard and screen readers. And it really helps you find things if you're doing most of the tests, even if they're not keyboard or screen readers, with a keyboard and screen reader. Um, so these checks, and if you go to the slides in the, the speaker notes, there's a little more detail about what you might be checking. Um, so checking that the page title describes its topic or purpose. What are you hearing in the screen reader? Is it telling me what the page is? Is there a way to is there a skip link um, to skip the navigation? Is content announced in a meaningful order when you navigate through the content or tab through the items? Are they in the order that you expect, especially based on visual? Um, our focus in here is visible. I mentioned that that's one of the things that I see as an issue a lot, and it makes it really hard to test. Um, so if you do have a way to fix that before moving on, I do recommend it. Um, let's see. Um, you want to make sure that on focus, you're not changing context, um, that all functionality is operable with keyboard alone, so that's why I recommend using keyboard for most of the tests. Um, that will help you determine if it is operable. Um, making sure keyboard focus doesn't get trapped, links are meaningful, um, and uh, content on focus is dismissible on the whole system, and interactive elements, screen reader announces what something's called, what kind of thing it is, and what state it is. So this is name world value, 4.1.2, and so this one, I, I was getting a little confused about it, so I found this helpful guidance is, you know, that what something is called, what kind of thing it is, what state it is. So maybe it's a checkbox that's called I agree, and it's not checked. So you want the screen reader to be able to tell you those three facets of it. And something that I've seen where this is an issue is something that says clickable. I'm like, that's not clickable. If I click on it, nothing happens. Why is it saying it's clickable? So there's some ways that, um, you know, code will be set up such that something will be marked that's clickable, that's not. Um, okay, so free tools for helping with this. Um, NVDA is screen reader for Windows. It's a free download, and you install it. Um, and VoiceOver is pre-installed on Mac OS. Um, so a lot of people use JAWS, but it does come at a cost, so these are some free options. And then also W3C, those easy checks. There's one for page title and for scheduling. There are a few mouse and pointer specific success criteria, so you would need to test those. No specific tools for this, just your mouse or pointer device, um, so your, your peripherals for your your computer that you're testing with, um, and um, some success criteria here is that content on hover focus, um, meets all the needs, um, driving motions is an important one that we're trying to make sure that you don't have to do a drag with your mouse or pointer or finger on a touch device, um, you don't have to make a specific path that those things can be done with a, a quick, a simple, active 
information. Okay, then I'm going to check autoplay. Is there anything on the screen, on the web page that goes by itself, that automatically goes? So if that's audio or video, we want to make sure you can have control over that topic as if there's no question. Again, no particular tools for this that I've found to help, just leaving a manual review. Um, then multimedia. So this might be your, your YouTube embed, your video embed, um, or audio, your podcast. Um, so again, no specific tools, just needing to check that things have captions, that things have audio descriptions, um, there's no flashing, etc. Forms. So there are a lot of things that can go wrong with forms. Um, and there are a few things that we need to check. I think it's also important to note that when I say forms or user input, that could mean your search bar that's in your header on every page. So that is an input, so it has some of these requirements. Um, it's also maybe the newsletter sign up in the footer where somebody just enters a email address. I know I don't always think of those when I think of the word form. I think of, you know, name address, um, a full page form, but those have those requirements. Um, so, Automated tests do help with a lot of these. They will fly if labels are missing, for example. Sometimes, depending on the structure of the code, um, they'll get flagged by not having a label, even though a label's there and is announced. So this is where this reader is helpful. It's really important to do these tests with keyboard and screen reader because um, a lot of forms do work just fine for a mouse or pointer, but not at all for screen readers, and that can be a real issue. Um, so it's important to, to make sure that um, that you can get through that whole process for that form. It could be multi-page, it could have error um, identification. We want to make sure that's all working. And especially with errors, um, that they are set as alerts, that when you're listening to screen reader, that those errors are coming up without you having to go and find them. Because how are you going to know they're there? Um, so, so that's where you're going to code it so that it'll pop up um, even without me navigating to it, for example. Um, so some tools, again, W3C Easy Checks, they have one for form field labels and one for required fields to make sure that required fields are indicated. Although there has been some back and forth on do you indicate required fields or do you indicate optional fields? Um, and I know USWDS has had some um, back and forth at the US web design system. Um, then we check contrast. Um, so color contrast, making sure um, that that text especially, but also um, user interface elements, so that search icon, um, or that Facebook logo, you want to make sure those have enough contrast. Um, so text is usually 4.1 to 1. UI and graphical objects are 3.1 or 3 to 1. And so the tool that that is helpful for this is, um, this is from TPGI, um, the Color Contrast Analyzer, and it does use the British spelling there. So C-O-L-O-U-R, and Analyzer with an S, um, and there are links in the presentation. Um, but that's a great tool because it has an eyedropper function, so if you have a image background to text, which Again, an uh, automated checker can't necessarily test, um, although they can test some things where it's just text color equals, background color equals, it can flag that. Um, but if background equals this graphic design, then you'll need to go in with your um, picker 
find the part of the image that is closest to that text color and just double check that the contrast is right. And it's all like this will help with that. And it'll tell you what the contrast is and what it's expected to be. Um, screen settings, okay. So some of these can be disruptive to test because they, if you're turning on high contrast mode, you might not be used to using that, so things are gonna look different. Or if you're zooming in or changing the screen resolution, that really changes how things work on your computer. So I like to group these things together um, rather than doing them one here with this, one here with that, and having to keep going back and forth and changing my settings. So one thing is that Windows High Contrast Mode um, is not written into WCAG as something you need to do, but 508 does have something that says you shouldn't disrupt accessibility features. And many people consider Windows High Contrast Mode as an accessibility feature. So that's one reason that I do test that. It is recommended by Accessibility Insights for Web um, to test and um, we do have a situation where most of our developers are on Macs, um, but you can test that mode with browser stack. Um, but that way to high contrast mode isn't available on Mac because it's a Windows feature. Then, um, so we're up to step 10 of 12. Um, so we're getting it. Um, Things that are across multiple pages. So again, okay, I've said a couple of times, we're testing a page or a process, but it's in an ecosystem, and there are rules about consistency across pages. So these are the success criteria where you do need to look at other pages on the site. So one is multiple ways. Um, you need multiple ways to find a web page. So if you have a search, that usually uh, like covers this. If you have a site-wide search, you can search for a page, you can find it that way. Um, you have an internal thing on the site, um, maybe you have a table of contents or a site map. Um, so you just want to make sure there are multiple ways. Um, and this is something that I check in particular if there's no site-wide search, um, because then you might have to try a little harder to, to make sure. Um, the other things that are consistent, that need to be consistent across pages, are navigation, um, contact and self-help details, so help, um, and then elements. If you have the same type of component or element on different pages, you need to make sure that it's identified the same way. Okay, and then into one of those other nice buckets that I had before. So um, some of the common issues in this are um, tables are a big one, um, and that, that falls under that info and relationships. Um, tables can be difficult to get right, um, so it's something that needs to be checked and needs to make sure that, that headers are associated properly with the content that you can navigate through it with the screen you don't understand what's happening. Um, there are some uncommon scenarios. Um, so I've yet to see custom keyboard shortcuts. I'd love to hear if anybody has. Um, there's not usually a timing component to the websites that I review or motion actuation. So, like, does moving your cell phone when you're on this page change what's going on on the page? Um, I, I haven't worked with those much, um, but very curious if anybody has. One tool I'll call out here is Andy. So this is the Social Security Administration. Came up with this tool. It's another um, browser um, bookmarklet, and it does a lot of things. Most of those things I don't use, I use other tools, but I found it's the best for tables. It will highlight, um, you can go to a table, click a, or like, go to a cell. It'll tell you what headers are 
appreciated by that. So, so it makes it easier to review tables. Okay. And that's the test. So then you might be at a point where you want to record your findings and report them. So if we have the voluntary project accessibility template, you might have heard of that, or at other government sites, it's often used for government. Um, that's the template if we're being picky. Um, and you would create an accessibility conformance report using that template. So what you come out with the built-in version is your ACR. Um, if you don't need to do it, you can. Um, a report that I, I would put together would have a summary. How's the website doing? It has critical issues, or actually it's pretty good, but there's always room for improvement. Um, and then recommendations for priorities. Um, you know, after going through your site, number one, please fix the focus <laughs> indication. Um, number two, header and footer, make sure your navigation is keyboard accessible. There were some issues there. Number three, then go through the rest of the report and see what it flows you through, what things you can do. So just some guidance about, um, about priorities there. Um, I always include something about methodology. How did we test this site? Um, so it was tested on the Mac or it was tested on a Windows machine. It was tested using um, the tools that I said in this um, presentation. It was tested using VoiceOver or JAWS or NVDA. It's really important to get some of those details, especially for the um, screen readers because they act differently. Um, I like to call out areas of success. Um, it, it's important to you know celebrate where a website is doing great. Um, and there might be a lot of great things. It might be daunting to look at a list of issues, but a lot of them might be low, lower impact. Um, and so you do want to call out those success, and then the issues, of course, you want to report with some details so people know um, how to approach them with fixing them. Okay? So coming to the end of this presentation, um, I have another slide. Most of these tools have already talked about. The one that I haven't yet is Lister's voice control. And this is something that I just found. I was looking for a voice control software that I could just test out with. So very interested if anybody else is using anything. I know Dragon or Dragon Naturally Speaking is a, a voice It, it's something that I want to start bringing into my testing. Um, so curious about that. But yeah, so um, so the slides are available at the GovCon schedule. Um, and now uh, questions, comments? Does anybody else use voice control software? I'd love to hear more. Is the Andy tool just for web or can it be used for PDF? I believe it's just for web um, because it does get um, plugged into the browser itself. So it would be in um, like a PDF software. I don't think it would work if you're looking at a PDF in the browser. I haven't tried it, but I doubt it. Recommended tool for checking tables within PDFs. Um, so there's Acrobat's Checker, which will give you something. Um, so it'll tell you if something's irregular, um, a table, um, and it'll flag some issues with headers. It won't always do a great job, though. I know there's Common Look, it's a paid product that people use for those meetings. Does anybody else have PDF recommendations? Source document, right. So if you're creating a PDF from a Word document, we're on Word's accessibility checker. Um, and it'll flag some things for, for tables, and you can fix them with that. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. This is a very thorough process. I really appreciate it.
was there after I had Coach Sprague, who was kind of through the end of his slide, and he was dead in the end of his slide. Um, what was the first part? So advice to a company that's doing more manual testing. Well, I think that's good. I think we have to do manual testing. Um, I think it's possible to use the tools, like the tools that I shared to help with the manual testing. Um, and yeah, I, I think most of the presentation is, is what I would say.